Shalom, Saints. Ty Green here. I'd like to draw your attention to one of the greatest miracles that we could see today if only we would trust God. We, as in mankind, but more specifically, those that farm in Israel, the Jews that farm the land in Israel. What I'm going to share here not only applies to the land of Israel, but also to each of our lives in our walk with Christ. We read his word, we hear his word, yet if we trust his word, which is followed up by the exercising of our faith, then we will see the promised blessing thereof. Here's the miracle. The sowing and reaping of the land in Israel was set for six years, and for the seventh year, there was a year of rest for the land. But on that sixth year, God will provide a bountiful harvest of overflow that would last for three whole years. So that's enough food for all of the seventh year in which they were not to sow nor reap. The eighth year, in which they could begin to plant again and then all of the ninth year. They would reap harvests in the eighth and ninth years and have the addition of the old stores. Surprisingly, this is not practiced today amongst the farmers in Israel. Not as far as I know. Maybe some of you know different. If you do, speak up in the comments section. We'd like to know this. I'm going to share some documentation on this that I found as we go along. So let's open up our Bibles to the book of Leviticus chapter 25. And we're going to go through verses 1 through 23. All right, let's get to it. Leviticus 25, starting at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses at Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. So we can see here that this involves the land of Israel specifically. Let's keep reading. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. You shall neither sow your field nor prune your vineyard. Here we see the establishment of sowing and reaping for six years, and the Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord in that seventh year. Let's continue. That which groweth of its own accord of your harvest, you shall not reap, neither gather the grapes of your vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you, for thee, and for your servant, and for your maid, and for your hired servant, and for your stranger that sojourneth with thee and for your cattle, and for the beast that are in your land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. Here, we see the benefit for Israel when they honor the seventh year. The Sabbath year also is called the sabbatical year, the Shemitah year. Let's go to verse 8. And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. So after the seven Shemitah years, which total forty nine years, something special happens in the fiftieth year, the Jubilee year, a Yovel year. Now, this is no longer practiced as many of us have searched. For when the Jubilee year was and is, one of the main reasons it is not observed or commemorated involved 
many different opinions, one of which is whether all 12 tribes are living in Israel. And a link to that is in the box. Let's keep going. Then shall you cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So Israel was to do this on the Feast of Atonement in the Jubilee year. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of your vine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou shalt sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor. And according unto the number of years of the fruits, he shall sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof. And according to the fewness of years, thou shalt diminish the price of it. For according to the number of the years of the fruits, doth he sell unto thee. You shall not therefore oppress one another. But thou shalt fear thy God, for I am the Lord, your God. Okay, folks, now here's where we get into this focal point. Verse 18. Wherefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit and you shall eat your field and dwell therein in safety. And if you shall say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. And there's the miracle we could see right there. And you shall sow the eighth year and eat yet of old fruit until the ninth year. Until her fruits come in, you shall eat of the old store. Now that's awesome. Then here's the reminder of who the land belongs to. God. The next verse, 23, the land shall not be sold forever. For the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. God says, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. He is telling Israel, we're in this together. But let's get back to the miracle that we would see of the harvest in the sixth year. Seems clear. God says for Israel to do his statutes. These are his ordinances, his customs, and they are to be done by Israel for all generations to keep his commandments and do them. And if they were concerned about the harvest provision of the seventh year, the Sabbath of rest unto the land, the Sabbath for the Lord, God would bless them into the overflow in the sixth year for that harvest to last for three years. Wow. Imagine if Israel had trusted God enough to do this today. Instead, like we sometimes do, 
We don't believe that God will do it. It seems a bit impossible. Now, we can make sense of how it possibly could be done. We've done it personally at some point, And we can see how Israel scripturally is a representation of mankind. Let's take a look at the workaround and see how this is done today. How man tries to work around what God says other than simply trust him. Now, I know it's hard sometimes, but take a look at this extreme. In this JTA article, look at this. Let's read this. How was Shemitah observed in the past? Because the commandment applies only in the biblical land of Israel, it became largely theoretical once the Jews were exiled by the Roman Empire after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 136 CE. Generations of Jewish farmers in Europe, the Middle East, and elsewhere had no religious imperative to let the land rest. But once Jews started returning to Palestine in the 1880s and founding Kibbutzim, Shemitah again became relevant and problematic at a time when Jewish farmers were struggling just to keep their farms viable. A year of no production would have been a death blow. Now, how many know that this would have been a perfect opportunity for the Jews to trust God? Right there. Let's keep reading. To skirt that problem, rabbis in Israel created something called the Heter Makara or sale permit. Similar to the sale of leavened food for Passover. The permit allowed Jewish farmers to sell their land to local non-Jews for a token amount, then hire non-Jews to do the forbidden labor. That way, because it wasn't quote unquote their land, Jews could keep their farms going without sin. Folks, even today, this sale permit is disputed. Citing if it were not done, many would die of starvation but would observe the Shemitah without endangering lives when a competent rabbinical court will conclude that the sale is not necessary. Now, how does one believe that God who knows all and sees all doesn't see this and know what they're doing? How can we cry Jehovah Jireh, my provider, if at the opportunity of provision, we choose to do it ourselves? The strongholds of sin, are you bound? The provision of salvation through Jesus Christ means that you have been set free. Now, do we trust God to remove the desire to return to the bondage in which we have been freed? Or do we try to do the work around? Remember, Leviticus 25 and 23 says, For you are strangers and sojourners with me. Once we are saved, the Lord is saying, we're in this together. Trust him. Let's keep reading. How is Shemitah observed in contemporary Israel? As Israel's population and agricultural sector expanded, so too has the hand-wringing over Shemitah. Here are some of the Jewish legal acrobatics they use to get around it the workaround the sale permit israel's chief rabbinic allows every farm to register for a sale permit like those allowed in the 1880s and the rabbinic sells all the land to a non-jew for about five thousand dollars total according to rabbi haggai bar giora who oversaw Shemitah for Israel's chief rabbinate seven years ago. At the end of the year, the rabbinate buys back the land on the farmer's behalf for a similar amount. Bar Giora chose a non-Jewish buyer who observes the seven 
Noahide laws. Now we heard about this before, right? The Torah's commandments for non-Jews. Now I've read the documentation that it's even sold for two years. All of the documents are linked in the box. Next, it talks about greenhouses. Shemitah only applies if the crops are grown in the land itself. Therefore, growing vegetables on tables disconnected from the land steers clear of violating the commandment. The workaround. Then it goes into religious courts. Farmers aren't allowed to sell their crops, but if crops began growing before Shemitah started, people are allowed to take them for free. So through another legal mechanism, a Jewish religious court will hire farmers to harvest the produce and, and the religious court will sell it. But you won't be paying for the produce itself. You're only paying for the farmer's labor. You get the produce for free. Wink, nudge, it says. Then it says, not observing Shemitah. Most large-scale Israeli farmers use a sale permit in order to obtain rabbinic certification for their crops, Bar Giora says. But some small non-religious farmers who sell their produce independently ignore the sabbatical year completely and do not receive kosher certification. Once again, the workaround, folks. All of that work, the legal acrobatics the writer of this article calls it it seems so unnecessary doesn't it when all they had to do was follow his instructions and trust him for the rest then we could see the blessings into the overflow but there's more to it than that there's a relationship there that develops as we trust in the lord See, once we're clear in what we need to be doing, just like the Jews were given instructions on the sowing and reaping for six years, and at some point there will be a challenge involving something that appears to be great, a big deal. But the truth is, we weren't even to be concerned about it. We are to trust the Lord with the provision of addressing the issue. Just like the Lord with providing a bountiful blessing of harvest for three years for Israel. We do our part. He does his. Second Samuel chapter 22 verses 31 through 33 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God save the Lord and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power and he makes my way perfect. Now, I know this part of the passage of Leviticus 25 has more that we could get into as it contains yet another example of how Jacob continues to get into trouble with God. And within that, we can also see his long suffering towards us. Yet I wanted to zero in on the trust in the Lord. So as we are going through so much individually and collectively, we need to know that we should trust God. Just trust him. And the analogy here is real life for both Jew and Gentile with so much around us that we can look at with our eyes and say it is impossible. We have to remember, trust God. Go to him in prayer. Lay it down before his altar. And leave it there. Your faith is essential here. Trust God. You turn on the news, you're going to see something.
I don't know how we're going to get through this. Trust God. You're going to be confronted with some things that you can't see a way out. Trust God. He will provide. He will make provision. Just do it. Just trust God. Now, it's easier said than done, folks. We know this. But that is why we have to encourage each other. I am encouraging you today, and I may need some of you tomorrow. So, encourage one another in the Lord to trust him. He's got us. All right, I'll leave it here. Love y'all.